students, you may take one minute's break, but please join as early as possible. Yeah, Sarah is with us. And let's move on to the next session. So uh, our next session is with Mr. Rojit Chakraborty. So is with us. Uh, I'd like to request Parumita Jana, a fifth sem student of English Honors. Uh, are you here, Parumita? Could you please say a few words yes, as the introduction of uh, this reputed professor? So, uh, sorry, I'm okay. sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, just a bit, please. Uh, could you please introduce uh, uh, on behalf of our department, Parumita? A very good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Parumita. Please go ahead. Please Thank go you ahead. to each and every one of you for being with us today. We are pleased to be able to welcome uh, those, to welcome all of you on behalf of the Institute Shohit Matongini Hajra Government College for Women. I cordially welcome our guest teacher, Rojit Chakraborty sir. Sir completed his honors in English from the University of Calcutta in 2018 and uh, his post graduation in English literature from Benares Hindu University in 2020, he has cleared GATE in 2021 and has appeared for NEET. He has presented papers on Indian fiction, English language teaching and linguistic politics. He has conducted ELT classes for first generation English speakers. He intends to pursue uh, doctoral research in the future. Sir, uh, it is an honorable moment for our college uh, to have your prestigious presence in today's uh, class. And uh, once again, uh, thank you to all of you for your presence in this event. Thank you, Paramita. Thank you very much. Uh, so we get uh, to know a lot about uh, Mr. Chakraborty. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being with us today. Sir, uh, today is going to provide us insights on O oh, Captain, My Captain. Uh, as you know, this is a well-known poem written by Walt Whitman. And uh, the occasion of this poem is to mourn the death of uh, the then US president, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the poem uses extended metaphor uh, to of a sip of state and has been continuously adopted in popular culture. Uh, so we are eagerly looking forward to your deliberation. I am quite sure it's going to be very interesting. So uh, students, uh, now I would like to request sir to please commence this session. Yeah, am I audible? Over to you. Over. Yes, sir, you are. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for those kind words of introduction. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the organizers of Shohit Matungini Hajra Government College for Women for organizing this session and for being gracious enough to invite me to this session. And uh, especially a uh, special thanks to Yasmin ma'am for taking the initiative and giving me an opportunity, despite being not as qualified as most of the people over here. Uh, okay, and a good afternoon to the students and, my, and professors and honorable principal of this college. So the topic for today, which I have been assigned, is uh, the, the, are the two poems of America, O oh, Captain, My Captain, and Robert Frost's uh, The Road Not Taken. So I'd like to start by sharing my screen, and hopefully you'll be able to see into the presentation. Just give me a second.
Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is. It is. Okay. okay. Uh, could you Thank kindly? You. Yes. Yeah. It, it's visible, sir. Okay. Um, so the topic for today, while it is the poems, I have deliberately chosen this title, "America and Her Poems." The reason for that is uh, what well, poetry is a direct result of one's surroundings, the sensations that a poet gets, the values that they imbibe, the philosophies that they adapt are all a direct result of their locale, their culture, their heritage, and their country. It is therefore important that we learn a bit about America before we look at the poems that she has given forth. The American Revolution and the founders of America were these seven people, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison. They were the leaders of the 13 colonies of the British that the, the then British Dominion had over America. And they were thoroughly angry with the way things were functioning, the way the British were imposing taxes on the Americans, and uh, especially with Charles II. So they launched into the full-fledged, the famous American Revolution. And that is how, after when the British were ousted on the 4th of July, America was founded. So America was founded on some principles. And these principles are very important because they have record over and over again, and they still continue to record today in almost everything that America produces, its culture, its uh, politics, and uh, everything. And, and it is revived, and this belief is inculcated in every American and every immigrant who arrives to America. Equality, the first one which has been the most crucial belief in the American belief system. And this was given in the Declaration of Independence that all men were created equal. So to Americans, all men, and this is a time when patriarchy was the norm. So we, I will have to excuse, uh, ask uh, my female colleagues over here to excuse me. And as like we just recently discussed Emily Dickinson. But yeah, the belief that all men were created equal was one of the founding principles of America. Rights. Every person had certain rights and they have to be given to him. The right to land, the right to life, the, light, the right to equality. Uh, because the, every person, is, if they're born equal, they are born with equal rights. And it is, their, and it is that person's birthright to be given those rights. Next is liberty. Every man is born free and they are free to make their own choices. Now, the first, one of the most crucial things about the American independence was not only the freedom from Britain, but it was also the liberty from landed, uh, from poli landed politics, from uh, feudal lords, and from masters on different levels. So liberty was a very crucial uh, principle of found for the founding of America, which is ironic given the poem that we'd be discussing later. Opportunity. Opportunity is one of the biggest selling points of America, even today, and America is called the land of opportunities. And the Declaration of Independence guaranteed that every man is entitled to the same opportunities and that he is allowed to have them. Opportunities, and it doesn't matter who it is. It could be a shoemaker's son, it could be a politician's son, or it could be a landowner's son. Opportunities were the same for every man in America. And that is what it has uh, been. And this is why America has uh, attracted immigrants from all over the world. And this is one of the, uh, one of, this is sort of one half of the famous American dream. The last was democracy. America is a sovereign that is governed by a government of the people, elected by people and for the people the famous of the people, for the people, and by the people, given by Abraham Lincoln. And America 
has valued her democracy ever since its independence from the British. It is one. It was one of the biggest uh, argument points in the, in the recent presidential elections of America, and uh, democracy has always been a strong a, a virtue, and a, and dem- and the right to democracy has been a v- much coveted right by all Americans. Now we come to the first poem. Before we go to the first poem, let us see why this poem exists in the first place. The American Civil War, April 12, 1861 to May the 9th, 1865. A civil war is a war when uh, two factions are fighting within the same country. The country itself is divided into two parts and they are fighting against one another. That is called a civil war. This civil war was fought between the Union States, the North, and the Confederacy states, the South, over the cause of slavery. The Union, led by President Abraham Lincoln, sought to abolish slavery, while the Confederates sought to continue owning slaves. Abraham Lincoln, when he was running for office, had uh, majorly highlighted the cause of, the, had majorly addressed the issue of slavery and slave ownership. And one of the major selling points of his presidential run was that he would abolish slavery. The South, on the other hand, the Southern states, they had plantations and they owned slaves, slaves who Africans who were illegally bought and brought over to the America to serve as slaves in their plantations, to serve as housemaids and to serve as house servants. Uh, uh, the slavery, slavery in America has produced much great literature and one of the most seminal works is Uncle Tom's Cabin, which uh, I suggest all of you should read. Abraham Lincoln, 1809 to 1865. So he died just before ended. And this is the Battle of Gettysburg, which was fought in 1863. And it is one of the most bloodiest battles of the Civil War. It is what led President Lincoln to deliver the then famous and now famous Gettysburg Address, which starts with four score and seven years ago, where the American dream of independence and of freedom and all men were created equal were discussed. Uh, This is what how he uh, encouraged the North to continue fighting for this cause, even after the massive destruction and the loss of life in the Battle of Gettysburg. The war ended with the Confederate surrender on May the 9th, 1865. But Abraham Lincoln was assassinated on April 14th, 1865 by John Wilkes. He was shot in the head while he was attending a theater performance and he died shortly after. And it was his death that led the North, the Union States to get, to take severe strong steps which led to, which ultimately led to the Confederate surrender and led to ending the American Civil War. Now, Walt Whitman, who was a personal admirer of Abraham Lincoln, wrote the poem, the first poem that we would be discussing today. But before we go into the poem, let us look a bit at Walt Whitman, or Walter Whitman, which was his full name. He was born in Huntington, Long Island, America, which is sort of the east coast of America. He was a poet an essayist and a journalist. His transition from transcendentalism to realism, he was a poet who uh, who was a transition poet and he incorporated both views in his poems. Now, in this regard, it's important to mention what transcendentalism is and how it is the founding print, one of the founding philosophies of America. And transcendentalism, according to the dictionary, is a belief that there exists an ideal spiritual state which transcends the physical and the empirical. Transcendentalism was responsible for the vision of America. It was propounded by writers like Emerson and Thoreau. And this transcendentalism, which believed that there is something, there is this ideal state beyond our mortal physical experience. And it incorporated the view that every person no matter his social stature, no matter his profession, no matter his economic station, was capable of transcending and moving to that spiritual plane. 
However, Walt Whitman belonged to late transcendentalism and eventually realism, uh, which became the poetic norm of the country, uh, affected him as well. And he sort of incorporated both views in his poems. Ironically, his most, he is most remembered for the poem, O Captain, My Captain, which is an elegy, which is not even a transcendental poem or a realist poem. Uh, he's often considered the father of free verse. Free verse, which is a form of versification used in poems, where there is a meter, but there is no rhyme. And he is often considered the father of free verse in American poetry. He published his American epic, Leaves of Grass, in 1855 with his own money. It was a success, but it was brought under scrutiny for obscenity due to its overt sexuality. On Abraham Lincoln's death, he wrote two poems, namely, O Captain, My Captain, and When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed. And Ezra Pound, some of you may know him as uh, the editor of T.S. Eliot, the famous editor of uh, The Wasteland. Uh, Ezra Pound was a critic and a poet himself, and he called Walter Whitman as America's poet. He is America. So to read Walter Whitman is to read America. He died in New Jersey in 1892. So we move to the next poem, the first poem, O oh, Captain, My Captain. It was first published in 1865 by Walt Whitman. Let us take a look at the poem first. O oh, Captain, my captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. The prize we sought is won. The port is near, the bells I hear, the people all exulting. While follow eyes the steady keel, the vessel grim and daring. But O oh, heart, 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 Oh, the bleeding drops of red, where on the deck my captain lies, fallen, cold and dead. Oh, captain, my captain. This, by the way, is called an apostrophe, where there is an address to someone. But note the difference, that there is O oh, captain, and this is a captain, a captain of the ship, which we later find out. But the second captain is my captain. So the first captain is a public figure, while the second captain is a personal figure for him, for the poet narrator. Our fearful trip is done. Our fearful trip here refers to the civil war, that it has been won. The ship has weathered every rack, the prize we sought is won. The ship has been tormented and it has passed through intense and immense hardships. But the prize that we sought, that is the emancipation, that uh, the surrender of the Confederates and the freedom of the slaves, that has been achieved, we've won. The port is near, the ship has reached the country, the port is near, the bells I hear, the people all exulting. While I follow eyes, the steady keel, the vessel grim and daring. While people are celebrating this victory, this, this winning, this winning moment of a victory of this freedom of slaves, there is also a note of sadness, a note of fearfulness, that the vessel which is grim, because it has lost, the Union has lost a lot of people in this battle. It, it, is a, it was a brave act, it was a daring act, but it was also a grim act. But oh heart, heart, heart. Oh, the bleeding drops of red, his heart bleeds. The poet narrator's heart bleeds out of sorrow. Not just the sorrow of losing his crewmates, but on the deck, his captain, he lies fallen cold and dead. His captain is dead. He, he does not respond to him. Oh, captain, my captain, rise up and hear the bells. Rise up. For you, the flag is flung. For you, the bugle trills. For you, bouquets and ribbon reeds. For you, the shores are crowding. For you, they call, the swaying mass, the eager faces turning. Here, Captain, dear father, this arm beneath your head. It is some dream that on the deck, you've fallen cold and dead. He, he invites the captain, his captain, to rise up, 
to wake up and hear the bells. For him, because for him, he's victorious. He led the country to this victory, the ship, America. He's led America to this uh, noble act and this rightful act, the freedom of slaves. For him, the bugle trills. For him, uh, the people are celebrating, people are blowing the bugles, people are playing victorious music for him. But there isn't, but he is not, unable to hear it. For you, the bouquets and ribbon wreaths, for you, the shows are crowding. The shows, are, uh, the shows over here is a metonymy, which speaks of, which means to the thronging, the, uh, the masses, the thronging masses at the shows. For you, the bouquets and ribbon wreaths, they have brought celebrations. They have, they are celebrating. For you, they call the swaying mass, the eager face discerning. They want to hear from you. They want to hear your voice. But now the poet narrator comes to a little more personal. And he says, here, captain, dear father. He addresses the captain as his father because for, and if we go into our personal details, Walter Whitman really looked up to Abraham Lincoln and he considered him as a father figure and not just a father figure for him, but a father figure for the entire nation. He tries to put his arm underneath his head, this arm beneath your head, and he cannot believe it. It is some dream that on the deck, you've fallen cold and dead. My captain does not answer. His lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm. He has no pulse, nor will. The ship is anchored safe and sound. Its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip, the victor ship comes in with object one. Exult, O shores, and ring, O bells. But I, with mournful tread, walk the deck my captain lies, fallen, cold, and dead. My captain does not answer. He does not heed my calls. His lips are pale and still. My father, my father figure, this person whom I admire, someone who is supposed to lead me, he does not feel my arm that I've put under his head. He has no pulse, and the dead man has no will. The ship is anchored safe and sound. America is now safe. Its voyage closed and done. The battle has been closed and done, and the battle is over. From fearful trip, the victor ship comes in with object one. This was a fearful trip. A lot of lives were lost. It was a grave moment for America, but it has come out victorious. So he invites the shores to exult, to ring their bells, to cheer for this victory, to celebrate this victory. But this public victory for him, for the poet narrator, is not as great as his personal grief because he is mournful. He treads, he walks on the deck where his captain lies cold and dead. He has fallen captain, his captain has fallen because he was taken before his time. He was shot in the head. So that brings us to the close of this poem. So let's, let us look at some of the features of this poem. The poem is an elegy for the assassinated president, Abraham Lincoln. And it has eight line stanzas or octates. The rhyme scheme of the poem is A, A, B, B, C, D, E, D. So if we look back, if we take the last stanza, still, pale and, st uh, pale and still, pulse nor will, A, A, closed and done, object one, B, B, bells, tread, lies, dead. C, D, C, D. And the poem is made up of juxtapositions. And this is juxtapositions. These are what make a beauty of the poem. And we will discuss that in detail. But before that, the poem itself is an irony because it celebrates the victories of a captain. The captain himself is dead. So it is the biggest irony of life that often we celebrate the achievements of a person, but the, but the moment the, when we celebrate this, these achievements, we celebrate the person as well, but maybe the person isn't there. 
And we see this so often in cases of soldiers and policemen and other workers who, lie, who die in the line of duty. We celebrate them, we celebrate their achievements, but the person himself is dead. And those achievements and those victories may add glory to the person, but it does not mitigate the loss that the person's family or near ones or dear ones feel. And the poem uses an extended metaphor where the captain is symbolic for Abraham Lincoln, while the beard is America, the, which was later to become the United States of America, the country that Lincoln had led to emancipation. And this emancipation was, I bold, uh, used a bold font for it, is because Emancipation Proclamation was the first declaration where Lincoln, dis, uh, where Lincoln announced or he disclosed that all slaves were free, all slaves that have been in America for whatever length of time are now free. And this was what led event to the eventual civil war. Now let us look at the juxtapositions. Victory with loss. Though the crew vis-a-vis -vis, the Union has overcome the stormy war and emerged victorious, the captain, or Lincoln, that ushered them towards this tree is dead. So maybe victory, like I said in the previous slide, victory for one person is not victory for everyone. It is, it is probably victory for a union leader who believed in these ideas, but it is not for the poem, for the poet, the poet narrator who feels loss because his captain his president, Lincoln, is dead. Public celebration with personal grief. Although the nation is jubilant over the victory and the docks are full of revelers, the crew is sad at the loss of their captain. They are publicly, the celebration is public because it is a victory of the nation. But the loss, the loss of the of their life is personal. It's personal to the captain and the loss of their captain is personal to the crew and the people of the and, and the people of the country as well if we look at it as the loss of lincoln but people are more people, this is uh, people are more focused on the public celebrations more than the personal grief and it is, this is what happens in life uh, the nation with the individual while the nation celebrates a war one a war that has been won. The individuals mourn the death of their captain. The line, my father does not feel my arm, is reminiscent that the captain who was a public leader was at the same time a personal father for someone. The joyous spirit of the nation fails to quell the sorrow of the individual heart. Now we move forward. Well, these are the juxtapositions of this poem. And uh, it is a pretty straightforward elegy. And it, while uh, there are Im the images of the poem which we see are of the ship, of a, of a ship returning from battle, from a voyage, from a fearful voyage. And this is an extended metaphor that has been uh, used, Im implemented throughout the poem. So now we move forward by some 60 years and we come to a very different world. It was the time of the First World War, the First Great War, 1914 to 1918. And this was like no other war that the world has ever seen. It was no longer just factions or just ha two houses fighting against each other or two factions within the same country fighting against each other. This was one half of the world fighting with the other half of the world. People were being enlisted left and right. People were being encouraged to join this war and to fight for their country. And a lot of poem, poems have come forth from this. And one of the most, and this was uh, the most popular declaration of the most popular cl uh, clarion call to the country, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, which means it is sweet and noble to die for your own country, which Wilfred Owen in his famous poem, Dulce et decorum est, called it the great lie. It is never fitting to die for your country. It is never fitting to give up your life at all. But that was the time where 
America, where the world was, including America, people were having to make tough choices. People were opting to go to war, to enlist themselves as soldiers fighting in the war. And uh, they were being encouraged by the government, by the world, by the leaders to engage in this war. So people felt like they did not have a choice. They, feel like, they felt like it was their duty to go to war. It felt like their choices, their, their choice to live or to fight were taken away from them. So it is at this time that Robert Frost wrote his famous poem on the very theme of making choices, the road not taken. But before we go into the poem, let's look at a bit at Robert Lee Frost, 1874 to 1963. He was born in California, America. He moved to Britain in 1912, two years before the war began. His first work, A Boy's Will, was published in England in 1913. Before moving to Britain, Robert Frost did write a lot while he was in America, but he had never been published while he was in America. First, is, he had his first uh, publication breakthrough while in England. He moved back to America in 1915 during the World War One. He won his first, uh, first Pulitzer Prize in 1924 and subsequently three more in 1931, 37 and 43. He has popularized free verse in America. While Walt Whitman was the father of free verse, Robert Frost was responsible for popularizing it. He was named the Poet Laureate of Vermont. So we come to the poem. The Road Not Taken, which was first published in 1916, uh, which was the midpoint of the First Great War. So we look at the poem. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry, I could not travel both, and be one traveller, long I stood, and looked on one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for the passing there, had warned them really about the same. So the poet over here, the poet narrator, he is in a wood, a yellow wood, which signifies that it is autumn, and that leaves were falling down from the trees. They were turning yellow. And sorry, I could not travel forth. So he is sorry that he could not travel two roads, the two roads which diverged. He could not travel both. And he emphasizes that being one traveler instead, just being one traveler, I could not travel both. So he stood for a long time and he looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, as far as the eye could see. Now what is the significance of this? If we look at the two roads as two choices in life and this is relevant to every one of us and every, and it will be relevant to everyone who comes after us because life is all about making choices. And it is those choices that make us who we are or that identifies as the kind of person we are. So choices are very important and choices should never be made lightly. And so he took, he stood there for a long time contemplating what, so he tried to look down as far, as far as what he could, down one path. But naturally, the ramifications of making a choice are never fully understood until one has made them. So he could only see to up to a certain distance to where it bent in the undergrowth. So he could see the immediate effects of making a choice. Uh, for, for instance, if today some of you chose, most all of you chose to attend this, uh, the seminar, but if you had chosen not to, so you probably wouldn't have heard a great talk on this Dickinson, and that would have been. And but the but the things you've gained from this, you could not have predicted that you would be gaining them until you've had made that choice. So your vision of what a choice would entail is limited. So he looked only as he could look only as far as the sight was visible until the road took a bend. But then he took the other road into consideration, which was just as fair. And for him, it had the better claim. 
because it was grassy and wanted wear. It was grassy. Like if we see uh, paths in the woods, uh, if, uh, if someone travels, if, if someone walks down the path a lot, the grass stops growing there and that becomes a well demarcated path. But if there is a path, if there is a, another shortcut, which people tend to use, but not a lot of people know about it. So that place would still have grass on it. It will be prominent that there is a path there, but there is always grass in it and it won't, and it is in need of where to be designated as a path. Thus for that passing there had warned them really about the same, but he felt that maybe even if it hadn't been traveled as much as the first one, the other path still has been traveled by at least some people. And for him, they both seemed the same. They were both equal opportunities, which were worth considering. And both that morning equally lay. In leaves, no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. So that morning, both paths presented to him equal opportunities. And both paths were untraveled by. There had been no travelers before him. He was the first one that day. So the leaves weren't even black from someone stepping on them. So there were equal opportunities, both equally inviting, both equally beckoned to him. But then he chose to go the second way, the way which said was, which he said was grassy and wanted wear. And he kept the first for another day. He said that uh, he imagined that, yeah, maybe I'll travel that path some other day. Yet he knows that how one path leads, how one way leads on to a different way. And he doubts that if he should ever come back. And this is the choice. This is the case for when we make choices in life. Rarely in life do we get an opportunity to go back and choose a different path. Because once we've made a choice, we are presented with a new set of choices. And we keep making those choices until the initial choice becomes a distant point in time. And it is too distant and it is too permanent to go back to. It is unchangeable. And that is what he says. That yet knowing how lead, way leads on to way, he doubts if he should ever come back to it. He knows that I will probably never be able to come back to this point again. But I will take it into consideration that, yeah, maybe I will come back and travel this road. So he ends the poem. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hin hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. So somewhere down the ages, when he is an old man, he will be telling this with a sigh. Probably regret, probably tiredness, that there was once a wood which presented me with two roads, and I took the one that was less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. That has led me to where I am today. It is probably because I took that road that I either rejoice my decision or maybe I regret not taking that decision. But that is all I will be able to do. It will either be regret or it will either be rejoicing at the choices that I've made. But I can never go back and change that choice or make a different choice. Unless, of course, time machines come. But then again, that's a different area of discussion altogether. So now that we've done with the poem, let's look at some of the themes that this poem has. And Robert Frost, by the way, was a very philosophical poet. He wasn't an optimist. He wasn't a pessimist. He was a very realist. He believed in using uh, personal experiences to express universal universality. So when he speaks of a very simple, and he used simple images, like the image of a traveler in a wood with two roads in front of him, he presented the whole philosophy and the whole dilemma of making choices through the use of simple images. So the first theme, obviously, is the dilemma of making choices. Choices are very important crossroads in life. 
the choices we make define who we are and shape the trajectory of our lives. Choices can be made based on logic or emotions or a blend of both. But the choices we make are almost always irreversible. So it is always hard to make a choice, even when you're, it could be as simple as uh, choosing what dress to wear for the day. If you choose to wear one, chances are you won't be able to go back from whatever event you're attending to change into a new dress and come back. Or at least, even if you can, you won't gain back the time that you wore that first dress. Right, so choices are always irreversible. And if it's a very important choice, like whether I should continue to study or not, if I should choose a career in science or if I should choose a career in humanities, that is a choice that will shape the trajectory of our lives. And that choice needs to be made with a blend of both, or at least th these are the possible options. You could either use logic or you could use emotions or you could use a blend of both. But no matter what you use to make a choice, you should always be prepared with the fact that the choice you make is an irreversible choice, that you won't be able to go back on your choice and make a different one. In the poem, as we see, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubt it if I should ever come back. So I know that this path of mine will lead to a different path and a different path after that. And I doubt if I will ever be able to come back to this path and make this, the other choice and take the other path. I know I won't. I doubt it. I pretty much am pretty sure that I won't be able to do it. But there is this hope that I will be able to make a different choice. Which comes back to the next point, that is regrets in life. No matter what choices we make in our life, the thought of what may have been haunts every person. It is a very tempting thought. And I'm pretty sure every one of you must have had it and will continue to have them. And it is a very obvious and it's a very human thing to do. You will, as a human being, even if you second guess your choice, somewhere down the line, the thought of what would have happened if I hadn't made this choice, made a different one, is going to come back even if not to haunt you, but at least it would, it will have a permanent residence in your head at least for a while. And that thought is inescapable. So regrets, it could be a good regret, even if the outcome is good or bad, bad, the path we choose makes a difference. It could be a good regret that I chose to study instead of uh, dropping out of school. That's a good, that's a good thing, right? I have made a career out of my life. Or it could be a bad one, and it could be a proper regret. I wish I hadn't done this. I wish I hadn't said that bad word. Or I wish I hadn't been so rude to my friend that day when I was angry, and I probably wouldn't have lost that friend. So regrets in life, in human life, are inevitable. And regrets are a big, are a big part of life. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. So with a sigh. I, am, I have traveled a long way. I am tired of traveling this way, but I still let out a sigh that maybe had I made this other choice, maybe things would have been different. Non-conformism. Another key theme of the poem is the American spirit of free will, which I told you in the second or third slide, of the American spirit of free will and non-conformity. Although both roads had equal appeal that morning, we find that the poet narrator was more inclined towards the more grassy path that wanted wear. In the end, the, the poet chose not to conform with the popular opinion and you know, go down the path that has been often used by most people. And he takes the path which has been less opted despite inevitable hardships down that road. So a lot of critics and a lot of analysis that you read of the poem uh, mainly speaks of this, celebrates this as uh, the, the courage, the bravery to make a tough choice, to go against the tide, to go against the current or to choose an offbeat road, offbeat track, offbeat career choice. It is hard, obviously. It, it requires a lot of courage. 
it requires a lot of dedication on your part and it is and there are chances of failing because not a lot of people has have done it before you i mean you're making your trajectory up as you go along there is no guide map there is no road map to where you want to go but it is this nonconformism and this this inclination to do something that has not been tried before the land of opportunity the land of dreams this and the land of transcendentalism this is one thing that americans and america in general uh, values a lot which is why america celebrates nonconformity and nonconformism and doing something that is very different and trying something that has not been tried before going out of your own path making your own way that is one of uh, one other theme that has been discussed in this poem the spirit of individuality making a choice for one's own self unbound by responsibilities that is the spirit of this poem the road not taken we don't we make choices whenever we make choices our choices are not always our own right it depends on a lot of things uh if we if you want to go out with your friends maybe you'd have to consider am i earning will i have to ask my parents for money will i have to ask someone for money or will i have to depend on my friends to cover the costs or if you if you have to make a decision any tough decision in your life you always have to consider, uh, factor in a lot of uh this and that and a lot of factors a uh, lot of conditions and a lot of impediments that prevent you from making the choice that you really want to make so this road not taken discusses the spirit of individualism where you can make a choice no matter with no care in the world no matter what consequences your choices have you make the choice for your own it is easier said than done that is what this poem talks about in contrast frost writes a later poem where a later poem called stopping by woods on a snowy evening and there he makes and he, there he portrays making choices based on social obligations where the choices are no longer his own but they are uh, affected by society affected by his responsibilities by his obligations to society and his obligations and duties to other people in his life to his society to this country and everyone else but himself now the rhyme scheme of the poem it's a five stanza poem five line stanza so it's a b a a b as we see two roads diverge in a yellow wood a i could not travel both b so i stood and as i as far as i could where it bent in the undergrowth so a b so we have a b a a b again now the entire poem is a metaphor that like we discussed the entire poem is a metaphor for the entire process of making choices in life the entire uh, dilemma that one faces when making a choice and the eventual consequences of of after a choice has been made and it's a five stand line stanza pattern and it's called a quinte so that brings us to the close of this talk i wouldn't call it a lecture so if there are any questions i would love to hear them from you thank you thank you sir thank you very much it was an amazing session uh, so students uh, sir have given us a very comprehensive idea of this poems uh, with a very good slide presentation he has presented the political context um, against which this poems one of the poems was written and uh, his very student friendly manner i'm quite sure attracted you a lot uh he has covered as i told you almost everything important uh, aspects of this poem so covering thematic concerns rhyme scheme as well as the stylistic issues students uh, if you have any queries any uh, you know doubt or anything you may feel free to ask 
Okay, so there is a question that I can see by Minakshi yes, Shamanto. Yes, uh, what will the narrator 